excited today to have Ryan Odom with us on the basketball podcast. And coach, you don't need an introduction. You're the last team to beat Virginia in the tournament, which is a great thing. And took over at UMBC in uh, 2016. And prior to that, you've been an assistant coach many places and had many experiences, which I'm sure we'll talk about, but also a head coach at the Division II level. And just again, a great start to your career at UMBC. And coach, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks so much for having me on, Chris. Coach, super excited. Everyone I talked to in preparation and talking to you uh, mentioned about the penetrating kick. And certainly every game I watched and watched a little bit more on Synergy to get ready for this. And your team just does such a great job with that. And we're going to talk about that. But let's talk first about your personality, because I think that's even more relevant nowadays is that you're pretty laid back as a coach on the bench. Is that a conscious effort? <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm told that. I mean, my dad says I get that from my mother, you know, she's the patient one, more calm one in our family. And so I think that probably speaks to, you know, hopefully, you know, when you're born, you get the best that your, both of your parents have to offer. <laughs> and so I think, you know, patience is not necessarily one of my dad's, you know, or calmness is not one of my dad's strengths, but it is one of my mom's. And so hopefully, Whatever she has in her is rubbed off on me. But, you know, I think more than anything, it speaks to, you know, you have to be yourself and what you're comfortable with. And, you know, I've been fortunate and then I've kind of grown up, you know, in and around it. And, you know, this game has meant the world to our family, mom included in that. I mean, she's traveled the world and watched her sons play and watched her husband coach and now watched you know, both of her sons coach and, you know, my brother's a scout for the jazz. So he's kind of in that NBA side of things now too. So it's basketball has been good to the Odoms without a doubt, but, you know, because I've grown up in it, it's, you know, afforded me the opportunity, you know, to see so many different coaches do it and players play the game. I've been very fortunate in that respect from practices to games and, you know, I think more than anything, what I've tried to do is to give back to the kids that, that are under our watch. And, you know, I have to do it the way that I'm most comfortable with. And I think that's, a, that's the way that I can't be my father, right? And I can't be, you know, another coach that I watch on television or have seen, you know, through the game and try to do it, do it on my own. And, you know, I have found that, you know, the more agitated I get during the game, it takes me off my game and I'm not able to coach as well. Not everybody's like that. Some feed off the emotion and, you know, whether it's going at it with a ref or getting on a player or whatever, I'm not able to think as clearly when I'm worried about that stuff. So I try to sit back and, and read the game, I guess, is the best way to put it. Well, it's great to see the personality and you're absolutely right. Be yourself. And, and what people sometimes don't understand is that sometimes when you're a little more analytical, laid back, whatever you want to say on the sidelines, sometimes people criticize that as, oh, you're not in the game or you're not coaching or you're not focused. And I'm sure you're well past that point, but it's almost an insecurity for coaches that you're supposed to act a certain way according to how fans and media view a coach. Have you ever faced that at all in your coaching? I've never been questioned on that. But, you know, sometimes my wife will say, man, you sat down a lot more than you usually do. You know, she notices things. And, you know, certainly none of us are perfect and we all make mistakes. And that's something that I, you know, am constantly telling our team, you know, while you might have made mistakes with the ball, turning it over or missing a shot, missing a defensive assignment. You know, I made plenty of mistakes out there coaching you guys. And so we're in this thing together. And. The question is, what are we going to do about it, you know, going forward? Are we going to learn from the mistakes that we just made and, and not make them in the next game from a coaching perspective, from a player perspective? And, you know, I think that's the way we try to approach it each and every day. But I haven't criticized, at least publicly, you know, how, how my demeanor, I guess it is, on the court. And, you know, I like it. My players will make fun of me. I actually stood up one time during the game and, and I was contesting a call and I ran down the sideline and I was wearing some shoes that I don't typically wear and I slipped and fell. But it wasn't 
you know, it went, but I got up pretty quickly. I'll tell you, <laughs> I got up before up it fast. hurts, coach. Get up before it hurts. But, you know, this will speak to the relationship that we have with our players. You know, by it wasn't by the you know the end of that particular night that there was a video created by one of my players to music of me falling down and getting up. <laughs> so. You well, know, awesome. he's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, you got to have fun, you know, while you're doing this. And, you know, we certainly try to do that at UMBC. Well, that's great. And uh, great to hear. And that leads into the next question, which is your players seem to play with great confidence, especially in terms of their attack and kick, which we'll get into. But what's done behind the scenes that the public doesn't see that instills such confidence in your players in terms of their ability to play, you know, drive and kick and attack and, and shoot and make plays with confidence? Yeah, I mean, certainly we try to create that inner confidence. I mean, you have to be confident in your own ability. And I think a lot of times guys are confident, right? They come into college very confident. They've been the best player on their high school team, best player on their AAU team, whatever the circumstances are, and then they get to college. And then there's, you know, 12 other guys that are like them that have had that similar experience and always been the best. And so – You know, they come in at a time, you know, where they can be molded and they're going to have some adversity there. Not everybody's Zion Williamson, right? That comes in and I'm sure he had his own struggles too, you know, relative to, to what needed to be done for them to be successful. But at the same time, you know, I feel my job as the coach is, is to help them not only continue to believe in themselves, but, you know, to challenge them to believe that they can do more. And I think, that's a huge thing. And Seth Greenberg used to always say, your definition of playing hard and mine are not the same, you know? And I think young guys come in with a definition of, I'm playing hard coach. Well, yeah, you are for you right now. All right. But you're not for us. And so we've got to get you to that point where you're playing hard for us, you know, like we need you to. And then when you get to that point, then, then we're going to push you a little bit more because you never know. We might be able to get more out of you. And I think you're never staying still in that regard. I think what I try to give my players is, you know, what was given to me as a player. You know, I was very fortunate as a player to play for coaches that played a fast style, that played a confident style. And, you know, my coaches believed in me. And so I try to do that for my guys and while holding them accountable. They're not doing right. Obviously, they've got to be held to task. But at the same time, I'm not a coach that, you know, a beat you down coach to get you better. I'm a coach that tries to encourage and, you know, try to get the most out of my guys that way. And that's just the way I'm most comfortable doing it. Not saying that that's the right way to do it, but it's the way that I'm most comfortable doing it. And, you know, I think that starts with how you work. I mean, you gain confidence through how hard you work and the things that you do, the attention to detail, you know, that it takes to be successful in games. And there's no secret to it, right? It's got to be done in practice. And so we try to do all of that. We gain our confidence in practice and we encourage them to do things the right way. And, you know, I think that's where you gain your confidence. Well, it sounds like a great environment to play and learn in. And uh, we're going to get into some of the practice right now, but let's get to this penetrate and kick. What's the general philosophy in terms of outlining your dribble attack philosophy? Yeah, so we have a break that we run, obviously, on a make or a miss, you know, that we will run right into. And it's a very simplistic break. Guy to the rim, trailer, corners, you know, we try to navigate the middle of the floor rather than, you know, some will bring it up the sideline. I played in high school, brought it up the sideline. In college, we brought it up the sideline and then flowed into our Carolina kind of break. I like to try to get it in the middle, of, in the chute, we call it, in the middle of the floor. And we try to attack in the first seven to ten seconds, call it, on a make or a miss. And, you know, we play, you know, that kind of off the back of the guy that's the trail. And so my four men and five men, you know, because when you're, it's best when they're both interchangeable need to be able to shoot from behind the arc and you have to have a guard you know that can really get it up the court quickly and so we try to you know score as quickly as we can in transition and attack either the right or the left elbow depending on which side the ball is outletted to 
but the primary focus is everybody doing their job and getting up the court. And I tell you that to say we try to get the other team, we call it getting the other team in scramble. And we've all taught it on defense, right? We work on our scramble five versus four, you know, defensive scramble drills where, you know, you're having to talk and communicate and rotate and make up for one another or take up for one another. And so from an offensive perspective, we try to get the other team in scramble as quickly as we can. And the way you do that is with your pace, getting it up the court and putting pressure on them with the ball moving fast up the court by the pass or the dribble. And then you also do it with your bodies. And then like for my guys that are guys that run the wings and get to the corners, you know, the way I, and the guy running to the rim, first guy down, we compare that to a little bit, when I first introduced it, it's like football, right? So everybody has a job to do and when they're running a specific play. And, you know, when Tom Brady, you know, goes in and gets the snap and the wide receivers head out and the tight end goes here or there, they have to run their routes. And so that's what we say our guys are doing when they run the break. Like you have to run it every time, whether you're getting the ball or not. And a lot of those and football players, they're not getting the ball. I mean, they're getting it once every however often, right? And so, you know, we've got to do our job the same way that they do theirs. It's a, almost a disguise, and it puts pressure on the defense. Well, it's a great um, analogy, Coach, great analogy. Just a few clarifications. Are they set lanes, or do you go closest lane for your wings? Closest lane. Yeah, okay. closest lane. And sometimes they'll end up on the same side. It happens and we'll have one guy run through or he might even cut direct across the court. You know, sometimes like if he's out on the right wing, right. And another guy's already ahead of him. He may cut across the middle of the court because the ball hasn't quite gotten there, but he's got to use some discretion there. He can't just run right in front of the ball and slow the ball down because the ball is coming up the middle. It's not coming up the side. Is it the so second time, player's responsibility to figure that out, Coach? Or is it, it like, is. yeah. Okay, so can they, can they verbalize push like the first player goes through, or they have to be the one that respaces the second player? It can be either way. He can call okay. that guy. He can tell that guy to go through, or he can cut across himself to go opposite of the guy that's ahead of him and just read the play. And so it just depends. I mean, you may be in a 10,000-seat you know, arena, and it's too loud. You can't get that guy's attention but you also might be able to. And so we let them use their discretion. And we also have plays where if they end up on the same side, you know, you're in kind of a side hat ball screen there where, you know, you can kind of flow right into your motion as well. So it's not, it's not like you, we don't have something to go to if two wings end up on the same side. Well, that's a great point for coaches is that you're, you're making a mistake, not seem like a mistake. Like you said, by doing that. So that's, that's great. That's a great point for coaches to be able to follow. Yeah. I don't ever want them to stop playing. And, and we work the way we work on our break initially is we call it the 12 second drill. And so I'll put 12 seconds on the clock. I'll have, you know, an offensive and a defensive team out there. One's designated to block out. The other is designated to offensive rebound and we'll send two back. And what we do, and I really, they have to go rebound. Like this is not just run back on defense. So we'll stop it and shoot it again if they, if they just run back on defense. Cause I want to put them at a disadvantage where they're having to work on their transition defense well. And so, and then make it as realistic as we can, but I'll move around and shoot the ball. The guys will kind of run around and then the shot goes up and they've got to block out and play it live. If they rebound it, the offense, they'll, they, it's fair game. They can, we call it a dagger. We want to try to get a dagger. If I get an offensive rebound, we'll, we'll try to pitch it out for three. Or if I don't have an open layup, obviously we'll take the layup if it's there. If not, then there's defense and we'll try to relocate and kick for threes, you know, to try to get a quick dagger. And then the place goes from there. So make or miss, we're going the other way. And if it's a miss and the defense rebounds, now they're, they've got 12 seconds to try to score. And so we're running our break, and this gets them in the habit of really trying to focus on, all right, how quickly can we score? Sometimes I can throw it over the top because my big guy got ahead of their big guy. Sometimes I can pitch it ahead to the wing, and he can drive it and make a play and get them in scramble. Or sometimes I have to keep it and go off some 
the guy the trailer's back and try to get to the rim and make all of our reads there. And then whatever happens on that end, the other team is coming back and they've got 12 seconds. And then it stops on the original end that we started on. So we do that and I'll switch the time around, you know, as the season goes. But I really want them to get uncomfortable and understand, like, you've got to sprint and you've got to really go and everybody has to do their job or you're going to end up with a horrendous shot. (laughs) <laughs> and so I think it's good for us. It's been good for us in the, you know, I guess, four years now that I've been a head coach that we've been able to do that. And, you know, I think it's been helpful. And it teaches them that you give them more clock. Well, now let's use some discretion here. We're not going to be forced into a shot in 12 seconds. We didn't get it. Let's keep searching. We're always that. Keep searching. And that's where the drive and kick principles come into play because we're flowing right into that's one of our our motion uh, that flows right from our break uh, where we're able to to really drive and kick and four out and uh, you know ball screens are happening and and we're playing. So let's remove the ball screen right now in the first part of the discussion and just talk about general spacing principles in terms of your drive and kick. So a player has the ball, they're driving towards a player and away from a player what's the perimeter reaction in terms of spacing as you're driven towards or you're driven away from yeah i think one thing that's important obviously you know you try to put some markers you know for them out there so they know kind of where they want to be you know if you're in in four hour one in motion you want to make sure that you're not dead in those corners unless a ball screen's happening and somebody's coming out steer clear of the ball screens on before you right now. But I try to make make sure that our guys play well behind the three point line, at least two feet. You know, I want my guys, guys that we recruit to be able to shoot, you know, at least two feet behind the line and be shot ready in those moments because you know the closer you play to the line, you know, the easier it is to help and recover and contest some of those shots. And so what might be a contested one, you know, for one team that's right on the line for us, if we're able to back up two feet, what's two feet? You know, we got to be able to shoot the ball from there and make it consistently. So typically 15 feet away from one another, space two feet behind the line, not dead in the corners because you want to have the ability to not only drive middle, you want to have the ability to incorporate some of your baseline drives, you know, and drifts, throw behinds. So so, so coach, a clarification. Yeah, so a clarification that. So in transition, are you bouncing out of the corners or are you running to the 45 and stopping then? You're saying don't get dead in the corners. So going back to the transition yeah. component, yeah. Transition, once we begin to get it, it flows, so we don't score out of it. So if I'm coming down the court, I want him dead in that corner initially, all right, because it's almost like it's a one, three in the baseline. And so if you have a really good guard that can drive it to an elbow and get a shot or continue on and get a layup we want him to be able to do that all right but you're creating an open side there because the post guy runs dead to the rim turns around and faces back out towards half court so he's dead under the basket and so he's waiting for that point guard to see which side he's going to go to he'll go opposite the point guard unless he sees a duck in you know And so if he gets opposite, well, now you've got a guy in the corner stretched, and now it's on the guard in the corner, the defender and the guarding the guy in the corner to decide, am I going to come stop that point guard or not? And so we work on that every day. Drive to the elbow, they come help, kick to the corner three. And so that's one of our first options in transition is driving it to the elbow, kicking and getting a three in the corner. Now, as the defense does a good job and they guard that and they level us off or whatever, and we have to hit the trailer or, or at that point, now that's when they begin to come out of those corners. And then you're in your motion at that point. I'm not okay. sure if that makes sense. Or yeah, not, no, but. it's great. No, that's, that's really good detail and, and definitely paints a picture of what the spacing is because there is a little bit of a difference in terms of the spacing, in terms of the dead corner and then the 45. And that's great. So, exactly. So with that then, Coach, so you're trying to drive the elbows. Is that the primary goal wherever the ball is, or is that just that initial attack? Yeah, you also said, let's circle back. You also said you're trying to push it or pass it into the shoot. 
Now, if you're passing it into the shoot, is that to the point guard that's ahead of the play? Are you talking in terms of an outlet? Or can the point guard exactly can the point guard exactly. hit ahead to wings yeah. too? Dave Smart is one of the best coaches in the world, and now you can learn from him with never before available access. Three all access practices and one defensive coaching clinic are available at DaveSmartBasketball.com. What makes these all access practice and clinic videos so unique? Dave Smart has won 12 national championships and has a winning percentage of 92%. Dave Smart's Force Week Hand defensive system is world renowned and has never been shared in this way before. Dave Smart has a winning record in over 50 games versus NCAA Division I teams, having beaten Wichita State, Baylor, Wisconsin, and many others. Dave Smart is recognized by Jay Wright, Mick Cronin, Jay Triano, and many other top coaches in the world as one of the best minds in basketball. Learn from one of the greatest minds in the game who opened his doors and shared the game with us from one of the most successful basketball programs in the world. Go to davesmartbasketball.com now to learn more and to purchase all four videos. He can, if he okay. sees it. And I tell them I don't want them doing that all the time. And that's a personnel thing, you know. And the team that I had two years ago kind of taught me that because I was the one ball handler guy. Like, this guy's getting the outlet every time. You know what you're doing. You get out of here. And because I had two really, really good guards that, you know, knew how to play off of one another, I loosened on that. And so – what you don't want is you don't want two guys waiting for the ball all the time because then you know i have to designate that you're getting the outlet you're running unless you get the rebound now if you get the rebound you can go and i'll run and fill that corner spot and so that's where we got pretty good at it you know two years ago with that that really good group we had but we try to relocate, you know, we get the outlet and then normal outlet, just like you would teach your guys getting your back to the sideline over there or slicing across, you know, slicing across, you know, trying to catch it on the run, you know, and if you have big guys that can bust out and dribble it, you know, you can hit them on the run and go and now it's up the court further, but I let them throw it ahead if they see something. So if you see that, you know, I have an advantage ahead and I'm a good player on the wing. I can get to the basket and get them in scramble. Well, I allow them to throw that ahead. But I don't want them just throwing it ahead and waiting on the ball to accept the ball screen. Does that make sense? And they know yeah. the difference. I coach them on it. Yeah, no, it's great. And uh, actually, when you said, like, most people do, I actually posted something recently about the concept of the rebound which you would call down the shoot, but the rebound outlet to the nail area is what I call it. And then the percentage yeah. of increase and in improvement when you can get the outlet down the middle. So I'm totally in line exactly. with the philosophy of attack in the middle for sure, because it gives you multiple yeah. options. So we've got down the floor. You talked about markers. So in your practices, yeah. do you have actual markers on the floor? Do you have actual tape or something on the floor so they know spacing spots? Yeah, I mean, with my veteran teams, I don't. But, you know, initially we will, you know, just to make sure that, that our guys understand where to be. And then, you know, as you get more comfortable with it, you, you take it out. They won't need it as much. And I think that's a good way to do it. You know, you just put four X's out there and it can be used for a lot of different stuff. Well, in learning going, theory, would support that in the sense that motor learning skill acquisition would say that in, for initial learning, that's okay. But after initial learning, it becomes unnecessary guidance. So, yeah, no, it's totally yeah. in line with what you're saying that way. So going back to the penetration piece, I mean, I think it's, you know, we're trying to play off of, you know, a triple threat position. So every time you catch it, you know, you're facing the basket, you're shot ready. Do I have a shot or not? And if you don't, you have several simple choices. It's move the ball with the pass or try to get somebody else a shot and try to get this thing going. And so we never want our ball to slow down. We call it keeping it hot. We want to keep our ball hot, keep it moving, and try to create, you know, a gap, sometimes a double gap, you know, for guys to drive. And then that the way you do that is by driving to the rim. So we're constantly working on driving the ball towards the basket, stopping, pivoting, kicking quickly, 
And then the next guy has a chance, you know, to do that. And when we drive, like if you and I drive and kick on the left side, well, the two guys on the other side, we don't allow them to stand. They have to exchange or move or screen or do something quickly while that's happening to keep the defense occupied. So so all four players are moving on a drive. Yeah, they're moving. And sometimes you have to come behind. You know, sometimes it's a quick exchange there, and you never know. You might confuse those two guys that are on the weak side defensively, and then all of a sudden you've got room and rhythm to shoot just because they were caught in what is an inconsequential switch. But, you know, we want to try to drive to the basket. I mean, I think that's the best marker. You know, you drive to the – make them stop you driving to the rim. And when they do, when they come in and they full body help, now you've got to relocate and move on the penetration and then I I can't stand there once I pass it to you. Now I got to open up that gap and cut either on most times underneath. So you can then begin to drive towards the middle. Well, I saw some of your players on film actually when they drove, especially as you said, towards the elbows, they got to the middle, they kicked it. They actually paused for a second to kind of see where the ball was going to go next before they decided where they would respace. Is that again, is that consciously coached? You have to coach them on that because they'll start cutting in front of the driving line, you know, if you don't. So you kind of have to turn and look to see what that guy's going to do with it next because he may choose to rip it baseline. And then, well, then if that happens, then all of a sudden you got to kind of, we don't really like to back out of it, but sometimes that, that will happen. We love the, you know, like if I drive it towards the, just pretend I drove to the left block, you know, and I'm there at the block and I kick it out to you on the wing, and then you drive middle, well, that relocation from that block, all right, out to where you just left, a lot of times is open. So we teach our guys to drive it to the elbow, and they'll back to it, throw it back to that guy that just took my spot. I don't so know if that fill. makes sense or not. But. Yeah, no, I pass back to the fill yeah. line, so to speak, yeah. No, yeah. It's, it's really good. And so you teach back pivots. You teach, you know, the ability once they get in the lane – if they don't have an easy pass as they're dribbling or they don't have a score, then they jump stop or one, two stop and then pivot pass behind. That's what you're saying. Yeah, we've really worked on jump stopping this year, walked quite a, quite a bit early in the season. We had a new team, so it was new to them. We had two freshman guards that played, you know, a good amount. And then we had a junior college transfer that, you know, played a ton. And, you know, we walked quite a bit, you know, early in the season and they got much better at it, you know, as the year wore on. But it's just obviously the same old thing, right? It's just a repetition of just working on it in practice, you know, driving, stopping, passing. You're not going to get to the basket every time. So you've got to, in fact, you're, you know, get there less than maybe you think you are. So you got to, you got to learn to stop and be able to make the passes and two foot stops are, are best for us. Yeah, no, it's great. It's great teaching concept and great teaching points. And is there a preferred movement prior to a dribble attack? So say I catch it, I don't shoot it, I pass it. What's the preferred movement? Yeah, so we call it slice cuts. You know, slice cuts can mean a lot of different things in basketball. But, you know, if I catch the ball, say it's guard to guard up top, and then I reverse to you, kind of you've come out of that corner to the wing, and I reverse it over to you, we'll – cut right in front so it's not a ball screen but it's a slice cut right in front and then you'll try to kind of drive it right off my back towards the elbow and then those other two guys on the other side are exchanging at that point and spacing out you know and and maintaining a good amount of spacing the big guy's got to you know play off of that drive you know as the ball's there but that's one thing that we do and the slice cut can happen anywhere it can happen if i pass it to you guard to forward slice cut towards the corner right or it can happen guard to guard up front so i pass it you know you're in a two guard front i hit you across the top i can cut you know towards that opposite wing well you've created a good double gap there for a guy to drive you know with downhill towards that elbow and then you got a guy you know on the wing over there that can play off of that those are yeah, Those and are it ways just, that you can create bigger gaps to drive. Oh, it's great. And again, I see it a lot when people talk about pass and cut. They talk about a deep cut, like to the basket, empty the weak side. But the problem with yeah. that is one, it takes too long, and two, it's easier for the defender to be able to stop and hold help. 
So these shallow cuts, yeah. inside cuts, slice cuts, whatever you want to call them, are more effective in a sense because you remove the defender faster and create that gap. Yeah. So really good stuff. Really good stuff. Yeah. yeah. So let's talk a little bit, Coach, about the interior player. So what's the big? So the big in transition, are you running to dead rim? Are you running to a dunker spot immediately? Where's the big running in transition? And then from there, move into dribble reaction. Yeah. Yeah, so initially, the first guy down, so whether it's the four or the five, will run to the rim, and we have different actions that we create, whether it's the four at the rim or the five. But bottom line is they want to try to get it over the top if they can. So that And, and our guards know if you can't throw it over the top to him, by the time he gets – he's breaking the three-point line, then you can't, you're not allowed to throw it over the top. So that kind of eliminates some of those, you know, throwing it out of bounds things. Because if, if he's, if you're trying to throw it as, as he's past the, call it the free throw line, right? Well, you know, he doesn't have enough room to be able to catch it, especially under duress like that going full speed. And so you want him to have enough room to be able to do that. So our guys coached on that early in the season and we do it 5 on 0 every day. So, if you don't get the ball ahead there over the top, then your job is to, you know, if they're beating their guy to get behind him. And so to get all the way under the rim and you're obviously not going to score from there. All right. But what you've done is you've created a ton of space and you've created an awkward situation for your defender. And so you turn around and you face back out towards half court. And now he's got no choice really, but to kind of front you, right in the middle because you're under the basket. And so he's, he's naturally he's not sure which side to be on. And then if you've got a jet of a point guard that can get downhill, now you're able to play off of that as he drives it downhill towards those elbows and passes the elbow. The only guy left to really help there at that point is your man. And so your job is to position yourself. You know, the simplistic way to describe it is, you've got to position yourself where the guard can get you the ball relative to where, to how you're being played. And so if that means cut left, you cut left. If that means cut right, you cut right and get in a window to where now I can throw you the ball. If, and that's if he's going all the way downhill and it's like you're in a two on one situation. If you have really athletic guys, obviously they can kind of back out of there and you can throw lobs to them. Ours are more drop-off, you know, layup kind of guys right now. And then if they slow the guard down to where, you know, he stopped kind of, you know, just inside of the three-point line, you know, then now you're able to incorporate a quick duck in. And so we'll have guy really try to duck him in quickly, and you'll be surprised at how many times you can just roll the ball right in there to a guy just based on sneaking him. And we try to incorporate that. If it's thrown back to the trailer, now obviously you're in a high-low situation and you're trying to post as the ball's being reversed. And we'll throw it in if the opportunity presents itself there. And that's kind of the beginning of it. No, you got it. Go ahead. <laughs> so I was going to say, when you do throw it in the post, are you trying to play in the post or are you trying to play through the post in terms of the post becoming a, a creator, a playmaker, a passer, or are your posts trying to score inside? Yeah, a little bit of both. We have plays that we have when we throw it into the post, and we just added that this past season. I know the game's kind of gone to that. You know, my dad did that a ton, you know, obviously when he had, you know, Duncan and some of the better post players that he was able to coach back then, they played through the post every game. You know, I mean, it was was a matter of, you know, that's how we're going to get the best shot that we can get, you know, for our team. And we haven't, since we've been at UMBC, haven't necessarily had, you know, that hasn't been our advantage necessarily. And this past year, you know, we began to get a little bit better at it. We had some mismatch opportunities where we could throw it in there to guys, you know, that had a little bit of size and athleticism, you know, that could score the ball. So, you know, there were times where we run specific plays to get it in there, but, you know, what, what we tell our guys going into a game, they know we'll throw it into the post, we're in this. It's either a, you know, cut and fill situation. Uh, you know, it's a, a, a cut and a screen situation. 
You know, we have different actions that we use when we throw it into the post and we'll tell the guys going into a specific game, all right, if and when we throw it in, this is what we're doing. You know, obviously if a guy has an advantage, he's got a guy sealed up the lane and he can catch it and just go finish, then we want him to do that. But if he catches it and it settles and he's got somebody clearly behind him, well, now we want to create some action that, that the team's got to guard, that the defense has to guard. Another thing that I've noticed, and I don't know what you call it, I call them second cuts, but cuts off dribble drives. You seem to do that a lot, whether it's off a ball screen or if it's off the dribble drives, you have players cut because, again, weak side defenders tend to ball watch and fall asleep. And is this a cue that they can cut any time? Is there a set play that you do this? Or how does this work in terms of your offense? Yeah, I mean, they can do it any time. I mean, I think it's it's pretty simple. You know, you, the guy turns his head, a great opportunity to cut. You do it when you drive to the middle, you know, and pick your dribble up, and there's a guy in the slot over there, and he's kind of reaching at the ball. And if you're on balance and you control it, you can cut right to the rim and, and get something good. If the guy in the corner, his man, takes you on that cut, well, now you just slide up and you can kick it out. You know, it creates a little – a little window to to kick the ball out to. So, you know, the more teams that are more help oriented are susceptible to that, you know, because they're always, you know, in there helping a little bit more than the normal team. They're not locking shooters, basically. And you can do it sometimes when they lock you too. You can just quickly cut, you know, behind their head, you know, because you can just, they're even with you. And so it's kind of a race. So we'll teach them kind of both ways, you know, where the guy's helping and he's helping too much or you're being locked out and it's an opportunistic cut. That's what we call it. Make an opportunistic cut. It's such a powerful weapon that uh, coaches, if you don't have it, you need to add it to your penetration reaction because certainly, again, we like to always pretend that our defenders are really good at seeing ball and seeing their check, but the reality is it's much harder than that. Yeah, no doubt. Another part to this coach is, okay, so now we've got this great system. You've talked a little bit about your 12-second drill. You've talked a little bit about you do some 5-on-0. What are some other things that you've done in practice that have really helped your players develop these concepts? Because, again, it's one thing to have the system. It's another thing that they actually transfer it to the game, which your players seem to do. So what are some of the practice things that you do to help your players develop this? Yeah, so we open practice every day with, you know, skill work opportunities. And so we'll split ends and we'll have, you know, guards on one end and front court guys on the other end. And, you know, I give my assistants, you know, a good amount of leeway to kind of do what they want in those situations. And our guys will create, you know, situations that our guys will see in the game. Our coaches will create situations that they'll see in the game or actions that we want to try to incorporate within our, you know, drive and kick offense, you know, motion offense. And so, you know, you'll have no post guy basically, right? And you'll have four out and they'll, we'll create, you know, maybe it's a, okay, this time we're going to reverse the ball. We're going to hit the wing. We're going to cut in front. We're going to exchange on the backside. We're going to drive it middle. You know, we're going to pick it up. And then the slot guy is going to make an opportunistic cut and we're going to drop it off and he's going to get the layup. And so you, we'll just work on that. You know, it's it's five minutes of work there. I usually give them overall about 15, and they'll cover two to three concepts in those, you know, in addition to just getting shots. And all of those drills that we do where it's four guys, at least three guys will get a shot on one of those. So maybe one guy's getting a layup, right? And then the other two guys have managers throwing them a ball and a kick out. You know, so they're getting a shot as well. And then the next four go. And so, you know, or they rotate lines, however however they're doing it at that particular time. Or it could be even three on zero situation. Yeah, so, so basically, you know, we'll split at the beginning of practices. And, you know, the, the post guys will be on one end. Guards will be on another. And we'll try to – I give my assistant some leeway there to try to create some situations that we want to see in our drive and kick offense. And so, you know, they'll, they, like, I'll just give you one example of what we might do. Kick it across the top, reverse it to the wing, slice cut to the corner, drive it hard towards the middle, 
other two guys on the right side exchange, you know, prior to him really driving the ball or as he's driving the ball. And then all of a sudden we, we jump stop, we pick it up, and now we make an opportunistic cut from the slot, drop it off, lay up. Other guys will pop out and we'll have managers, you know, or the next guys in line throwing them, the other guys. So you get at least three shots per. And so we'll create, you know, situations like that that they can practice that we would like to begin to see when guys are, are playing, you know, when we're actually playing, you know, creating our motion. And we found that it, it's really helped us. You know, you give them – it's one thing to just say, hey, we want to run motion, right, and just move around and drive and kick in space. But you've got to give them some things that you really want them to do and practice them four on zero, three on zero, whatever it is, to give them some confidence and so they can read those situations. Because you are leaving it in their hands a lot when you run motion. You are for sure, and uh, you do a great job with that, Coach. And I encourage anyone that's it's keen on basketball and spacing and you know, penetrating kick concepts and whatnot to study your team because you do a really good job. And I'm grateful for you taking some time out of your day to spend some time with us on the basketball podcast. So thank you for doing that, Coach. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me on. No, it was great. And my really, I have to say this. I saw your dad run practice at Wake Forest way back when Tim Duncan was there. When I was a young coach, <laughs> driving around watching practices, and he was very generous. And then I was fortunate to have him up for a coaching clinic and in at the University of Windsor. And then fortunate enough to meet you at the University of Florida clinic and just quality people all throughout your family. And uh, I'm sure someday I'll meet your brother. Uh, I appreciate it, man. Wonderful stuff. Yeah, so, no doubt. No doubt. Right. And that, you actually, we played you guys when I was at Tech, right? Right. You even Tech. forgot that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we came up. I remember come up and coming up there, and, and you guys had a great team. Yeah, that was and, a great uh, game for us. I still Barry, right? Barry was the – Barry uh, Emlin, <laughs> my assistant coach, yeah, and you guys did it two different times, and I'm not sure if you're with them both times, but it was great for us and great experience, and Coach Greenberg was very generous as well with his time and his energy towards uh, our program, so it was, it was wonderful. So, that, great, No doubt. No great doubt. stuff, Coach. Have a great off season, and we'll see your team play soon enough. Awesome. You too, man. Good luck. Basketball Immersion is one-stop shopping for video learning to stimulate your basketball coaching using evidence-based practices. Watch hundreds of videos covering BDT shooting, zero-second skill training, how we teach using small-sided games and a games approach to coaching, as well as team concepts and systems like trail trap, flow offense, two-sided fast break, and much, much more. NCAA, NBA, pro, high school, and youth coaches are amongst the thousands of coaches who are a part of our community. Go to basketballimmersion.com today to stimulate your basketball coaching.